This is football. It's called The Beautiful Game. The Pride. Passion. And he hasn't! Three out of three for England! Well, he's fired up for that! The emotion. The adrenaline. Where does our love for this sport start? Maybe a place like this. Grassroots. Up and down the land, day after day, week after week, kids are living out their dream on muddy pitches, which represents their little piece of football heaven. I'm Wayne Baker, an FA registered referee Football's massive in this country, we all know that. But did you know 11 million people play football every year? That's some 8 million adults and 3 million kids. This is an incredible number, but none of this would be possible if it wasn't for that one guy stood in the middle of the field. You've guessed it, the referee. The numbers of referees is in decline. Over this next week or two, I'm going to be exploring why and what can be done about it. How can we get more referees involved in this beautiful game? Because as the saying goes, no ref, no game. Got a lot to do. Got a welfare officer and coach to talk to. Young referee, that should be interesting, uh, with his mum. Yeah, quite nervous really. Um, lots and lots of stuff that we could maybe learn. See what's happening in grassroots with referees and how they're declining, what kind of effect it's having on everybody and on the game. Um, possibly, not sure whether we've got it yet, but possibly, hopefully, an interview with Martin Cassidy. That should be really interesting. Uh, Chief Exec of Ref Support UK. An absolute driving force in the football world right now for ref safety, um, ref respect, ref support. I do think uh, that'd be a brilliant interview if we can get hold of him. Yeah, it's going to be uh, it's going to be interesting. This, I think, to say the least. I am very much looking forward to it and a little bit nervous. one of the impact that referees and the decline in their numbers is having on grassroots football. Um, with me I've got Dan Midgley and Katie Riles to get an insight of their perspectives and views on how this is affecting them at a club level. So Katie, what's your role within the club and what does it briefly entail? So I'm the club secretary, welfare officer and registrations officer. And what about you Dan? I'm the manager of one of the teams at the club. I currently manage the under 14s. I'm also a committee member, but within my role, obviously it includes coaching the kids and safeguarding the children at all times. Okay. And how would you explain the, um, the current referee situation at grassroots football? So I think at the moment there's a major shortage in referees. It's particularly difficult at our club to get referees. Um, as they say, no ref, no game. So what actually is it like trying to get a referee for your matches then? It's really difficult to be honest. I mean the club, we, we trained up nine referees and out of those nine we've got five left and only four of those are willing to ref. So we've got 116 children registered in the club. So if you double that for parents, we've got 232, 232 parents. 
and asking for any of those to come forward for training is zero. Yeah. Covered a wide range of areas there, it's like really quite upsetting. Wow, how much would you say is the, the actual success rate? So once somebody is qualified as a ref, how long do they stay? I know the exact figure actually. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just within our club, I don't know about nationally, but it's 44%. So the refs that we've trained and the ones that have stayed is, is 44%. How's this affecting you then, Dan, as a manager? As a manager, it's quite difficult, I'd say. Um, within the club, we're quite fortunate. Um, as Kate obviously said, we did train quite a few referees. Um, but at the moment, what we seem to be doing as a club as well, the referees seem to be... I'm a, self, um, I'm a referee myself, so what we'll do, we'll manage a game or we'll coach a game. And straight after that, then we're straight on to a game for our club. What's your biggest concern for referees within safeguarding? I think more than physical assault, my concern is, because um, we have a lot of young referees, is that the psychological aspect, that um, the impact of the, the verbal abuse will have on them really. Um, I mean, I've been at games myself where the ref gets a lot of abuse. Um, I don't think the younger referees are prepared to enforce the true power that they have by sending spectators off. Um, but I think ultimately the biggest concern for me is somebody getting getting seriously hurt. Do either of you think that that's actually a possibility then in the future? Um, I mean, we did have an incident not long ago with the under 16s where um, a big crowd gathered around the ref and obviously our chairman was on hand to intervene and de-escalate the situation. So I think as a club, um, I think we are quite prepared for situations like that. But I think other other grounds that we've been to, I think it is it is an issue. How do you feel about that? And do you think there's the potential for... There's definitely potential for someone to get seriously injured. I mean, you see it all over social media. Um, Recently, this has come out that um, most referees now they're trialing body cameras, and this is at grassroots level. Um, we're not even trialing this at you know Premier League level yet. So, why at grassroots level have we come to the fact that you know referees now have to have some form of security to feel safe? Do the both of you then have a a generally negative view? of how refs are being treated and viewed and looked after through the FA? Yeah, I would say so. I think it's it's the protection of them, really. Um, I mean, if you think all the parents and spectators, even the coaches, we've got 16 coaches in our club and, you know, none of them want to step up to be a ref. Over 200 parents, none of them want to step up to be a ref. But come Sunday morning, every single one of them on the sideline thinks they're a ref. So I do think that the people that have the personality and, and the guts really to step up to be a ref should have a lot more protection. So if this carries on and you know, referee numbers continue to decline, what kind of effect is this going to have on the game? Well, I think some clubs will have to um, shut down. There'll, have, there'll not be enough refs to undertake all the fixtures or we're going to have to have unqualified refs step up and then that obviously has an impact on the flow of the game on the players themselves because as Dan touched on earlier if you don't know the laws of the game it's difficult for you to enforce them and also the players learn from the referee if you've got a good referee they're talking to the players they're educating them telling them what they've done wrong and how they can improve the game so you know without the refs there's no game and if you could give one message to parents and players about reducing the abuse, what would it be? Just let the referee officiate the, officiate the game. You know, it's not got cameras around him. It's there to make a decision, whether it's right or wrong. It, you know, he's taking his time to go on a course. He's paid for that course. Let him officiate the game. If he makes a bad call, he might almost know that he's made a bad call but just let him officiate the game and end of the game, go over and thank him. I would say encouragement, not coaching. If you think you know the laws of the game, put your money where your mouth is, step up and be a ref. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. <laughs>
I'm here with Luke Houston, a young referee, to get his angle on what it's like to be a young referee. So thanks for taking the time to see me, Luke. I do appreciate That's it. All right. Tell me, how long have you been a ref? Approximately about two years. And are you enjoying it? Uh, yeah, I enjoy it most weekends. Some some weekends I go and um, I don't really want to wake up in the morning. And what made you want to be a ref? It's a bit of a tricky question because um, I feel like my mum mainly forced me into it. <laughs> so, um, but now now I'm into it and obviously I've enjoyed football. I've liked football for a long time. I think being around the environment of football on a weekend, I've really enjoyed. Fantastic. So, yeah. And is there anything in particular about being a ref that you do really like? Yeah, uh, I like working with um, older people. I feel like I've learned a lot from them, like the maturity levels and uh, I don't know, just being in and around their environment, their humour and stuff like that. So, down to the crux of the matter, are there any particular parts about being a ref that you don't enjoy? There's there's quite a lot, to be fair. Um, like I said, I, sometimes I don't like waking up in the morning. I remember the first, like, three weeks I did it, uh, I woke up and I just didn't want to do it after my first games that I've ever refed. Uh, just getting abuse from coaches and stuff like that, which I didn't really expect when I first uh, started refing. Um, I expected it more from players, which is manageable most of the time because you can give things like sim bins to, uh, like, I don't know, like, scare them off or, like, calm them down. Um, but with coaches, it's a bit harder because you can't sim bin a coach. You can, you can send one off. Um, but I didn't really have the confidence to do that when I first started, so I, feel, I felt very intimidated by a lot of the grown men shouting at me and stuff like that. So Does that happen quite a lot, then? Um, now... It's calmed down a lot more now. I've uh, found now now a referee, um, with like younger teams, uh, but they are refereeing like under sixteens and under fifteens, and um, I say that they were giving pretty much a lot of abuse. Calm down now, but it were a lot of abuse. Yeah, so now you've been a referee for a while, would you see uh, yourself maybe pursuing this as a career in the future or not? There's a lot There's a lot of stuff that I like to, that I, that I enjoy, like I enjoy playing football, I'd love to make that a career. Um, coaching, I enjoy coaching, uh, but I never thought I've thought as having ref being a referee as a career um, when I was younger, but now that uh, I'm getting better and I'm um, learning from other people, it's enjoyable and I think I think I feel like I could make something out of it and I could be a top referee. So if you were to say anything now to other young referees that were perhaps looking at becoming refs and, and you know joining the system, what kind of advice would you maybe give them? My advice would be just stick it out like at the start. Um I didn't enjoy it. Um and I've stuck it out. I've kept I've kept going each week. Um and now it's getting to the point where I'm in, I'm enjoying it more often. So yeah, just I think just sticking it out and see where it takes you. And what kind of message would you maybe like to put across to spectators and these other coaches? I feel like just think that referees are human, first of all. Um, they're not just like a piece of poo on your shoe and stuff like that. You need to, res you need to respect them like you'd respect everyone else. Good kick. Um, and I feel like shouting abuse at the referees really ha really has a toll on on their like I don't know their like men mental mental health and mm. stuff like that. So wow. So if I was to tell you now then that the number of referees in the system is reducing all the time, what would you say would be the reason why? Abuse, I think. Um, shouting from parents, coaches, uh, players, uh, and I feel like. I don't know. A lot of a lot of people might want to quit. Like I wanted to quit. Um, maybe some people haven't stuck it out, and then obviously people are struggling to find referees for games. So yeah. Well done, red ball number seven. Up here, look. It's all right. All right, player. Yeah. And so as a young referee, and obviously somebody that's that's had this kind of abuse, what kind of support do you think or feel that is out there for you? Well, I feel like support I have from my mum mainly uh, I come home and I tell her about games and we kind of laugh it off and stuff like that um, but I don't feel like there's a, a lot of a su support for referees there's a lot of people that I know who give me advice and tips and 
stuff like that. Um, but I don't feel like there's that much um, like thing that you can. So in an ideal game, game like. then, uh, what kind of support would you say would be would be great for you if you had a game where there was a mouthy coach or a, a nasty parent? How do you think that things could be improved for you? Players shouldn't. People shouldn't be coming and abusing players, abusing referees. Full stop. So maybe just stopping that and um, maybe a bit of zero tolerance. So if you come to a game, um, you abuse a referee, you get the, you report the parent, you report whatever, and then they're not allowed to come to a, a game for a certain amount of time and stuff like that. That could I feel like that could help. And um, how do you think we might be able to attract more referees into the system? How do we get more refs? I feel like getting younger referees. Um, and then like building them up. Um, but what would we do to make being uh, a referee attractive to them? I think I feel like relationships you can build. Um, like with young younger children, it's um, inspire a lot of people. Um, I feel like yeah, as I said, build, building relationships with older people. Uh, you get like you can put that out, put out that yeah, become more mature and um, stuff like that. I feel like that. Just wait there, Red. Just wait there. Hey, what well, do you want? Kick or do you want to pick sides? You want kick? All right, go kick, mate. It's at this point in the interview, I asked Luke to reflect on some difficult situations as a ref. And sadly, the tone suddenly becomes very dark. You have to bear in mind that this boy started his journey at just 14 years of age. It's my first time refereeing, so I'm, I think I made, I'm a bit intimidated. I made a poor decision. Um, and straight away after I made the decision, coaches on my back swearing at me, um, telling me that I'm useless. Uh, and so I didn't really know what to do. I didn't, I didn't realise I could give a red card. I didn't know, I didn't know what to do pretty much. So I just took it. I took it on the chin. Um, I feel like I got a lot of abuse from uh, parents as well, calling me like a fucking useless, calling me there a cunt and all, all that type of stuff. And I feel like. I, I every when like the night at the, that night I was thinking to myself, oh, I, can't, I don't want to do this. I'm uh, not surprised. Awful, so. I mean, at any age to be called things like that no. is bad. But at just 15, and on your first ever game was that? Yeah, first and ever. Nobody was there to stand up and nope. support you and look after you. Luke, that's terrible. Mm. Are there any other instances that maybe might have come across? I know I might be pushing you for lows and lows, but yeah. this is horribly interesting. <laughs> Luke's mum, Danny, was in the room with us while we conducted the interview. So we invited her to sit with us and share her experiences, both as a football parent and the mum of a young ref. I've just been joined by Danny, Luke's mum, because I think it's important to get your perspective on this as well. Obviously, you must have some fears for him being a ref, but you've been on the sidelines as well. Have, have you seen anything that's upset you? I have, yeah. When, uh, when Luke started refereeing it had just been we'd just come out of lockdown and his confidence were quite low and his self-esteem because we'd not been out for a couple of years so i thought refer referee were offered i thought it'd be absolutely amazing for a boost for him um little did i know or little did i expect the kind of abuse that he would receive i mean standing on the sideline um because he was 14 at this time um so i felt like i should go support him make sure he's got somebody there and listening to parents wow um just the things they were saying about him and i'm having to bite my tongue because you know i just thought is this part of the deal kind of thing this is what refs have to put up with but no, I don't think it is what refs should have to put up with. Has this opened your eyes somewhat? To yeah, this? yeah. Because I mean, I, I'm a parent as well of kids who play football and you know, I've stood there and thought, oh God, this referee and, and what have you. But definitely, definitely um, made me think a lot more about my own feelings towards referees and what I expect of other parents. Now, if I hear parents abusing referees, I've, I always say, you know, just remember, they, they, you know, they just if there's no referee, there's no game. Absolutely. So now that you've seen this, and obviously, I mean, you've been in football for a little while as mm -hmm. well, anyway. 
In your opinion, do you think it's possible that at some point in the future a referee is going to get hurt? I do, yeah. I absolutely do think referees are going to get hurt. I think we, I mean, we all love football or we wouldn't be doing it. We wouldn't be stood there every weekend. And I, I can see how people can get enthralled into game and stuff. But it's just, it's just pathetic, really, I think. So as a parent, obviously seeing, you know, 15 year old referee sometimes coming home upset that he's had abuse and stuff. Is there anything that you think out there should and could be done to protect him further? I do think body cams would be a good idea. I think young referees working alongside older referees is a, a massive, like Luke does, he, he works, luckily he does work alongside some great older referees for, for some support. And I think that's definitely a, a way forward. I don't think, I don't think a young referee should be on his own. And, and I do sometimes worry as well when, like when Luke's just told you about the, um, the, the fighting and things like that I do worry at the end of the game are they, are they going to wait for him are they going to you know you, we don't know do we if they're going to be there at the end of the game and maybe attack him or give him some stick this is great Danny I mean I know we've heard a lot about you know your fears and worries and obviously some negatives and things that have happened to Luke there's got to be something good about being a ref I mean I know I enjoy it but there's going to be something that you're seeing perhaps in, in Luke's growth or whatever. You know, how are you finding the positive side of Luke being a ref? So seeing Luke grow in the last couple of years doing refereeing, I think his confidence is absolutely brimming. I think it's done him the world of God. Um, he gets out there, he gets up on a weekend, he's earning himself some money to put towards his driving. And seeing, seeing my son doing that from where he was two years ago, um, like he were quite scared alive going back out into the real world after after 18 months or so of lockdown um and to see this side of luke i'm just so proud i i couldn't i couldn't be any prouder of him and i do think the confidence and the self-esteem has done him well in school i think it's done him well out of school well done yellows keep going good finish <laughs> Well done, everyone. Thank just thank you. you. Cheers. Thank you, Cheers. Well done. Well done. That's really, really good. So, would you say? Would you recommend other kids going to refing? I would. Yeah, I definitely would recommend other kids doing refereeing. Um, but they've got to stick it out. They've got to sort of expect this is what's going to happen in some aspects of it. I know it shouldn't be, but I think it does make them have thicker skin, if if you like. Um, yeah. Would you agree with your mum? Yeah, I completely agree. Especially the thicker skin, obviously getting the abuse and stuff. It makes you it makes you feel like when stuff people say stuff to you, it doesn't really affect you. you. Can kind of take it on the chin. And your mum spotted a growth in your confidence, and you know, and how upbeat you are. Would you say you you felt that as well? Well, yeah, I feel like confidence is a key part of improving as a referee. So I definitely feel like I've improved as a referee, and I feel like I've just speaking to people out. Uh, well, in school as well, out of school, uh, speaking to people I've never met before. I feel like it, my confidence has definitely grown massively, to be fair. Yeah, because before you were a referee, you wouldn't, you were like a little mouse. You wouldn't, someone spoke yeah. to you, 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 you didn't really want to speak yeah, or remember, anything. But now... I remember I used to keep my ball, my ball over at the fence. I didn't even want to go next door and knock on door and ask, ask them to get my uh, ball for me, so... No, you would. Well, now I would, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Inspired by these meetings and curious to explore in greater depth the way referees are seen and treated, I tried reaching out to both the FA and local leagues, as well as Martin Cassidy of Ref Support UK. But unfortunately so far I've been hit with a wall of silence. So for now, I'm going to take a journey to investigate how referees are looked at in a different sport. On our way to Bradford to see Jack Green, he's a rugby player. Um, actually really quite interested in this one to see whether all these, these rumours are true that you know refs are massively respected and they don't get any trouble and they control the game in a completely different fashion to the way football refs do. Um, 
you know, we hear it all the time. Rugby's completely different as far as respect's concerned. So I think to actually have a chat with the guy um, and get a real honest answer on what the deal is with refs, I'm looking forward to this. officials like that. Oh, for front Yara. Okay, so it would have been a penalty against you. You've then lashed out and you've kicked a player, so I'm going to yellow card you, okay, and I'm going to restart with a penalty against Leicester for the retaliation. Okay? Yeah, he knows he's, uh... It's quite clear. Mall is formed, held up, unplayable, turn of a ball, no issues whatsoever. I don't think we've met before, but I'm the referee on this field, not you. Stick to your job and I will do mine. If I hear you shouting for anything again, I'm going to be penalising you. This is not soccer. Is that clear? Back you go and get on with the game. I'm here with Jack Green, who plays rugby for Dudley Hill. Is that right? Yep. Um, just to get a rugby perspective on refereeing and the differences between rugby and football. Um, so thanks for joining me. I do appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, so what, what do you think the main challenges are that rugby referees face? Oh... I think it varies on what level the sport's at. So as an individual that's played both football and rugby, what would you say are the main differences to how the referees are treated in these sports? I think the main word, the big difference is the word sir. There's no need to push him. We're not going to okay. reverse it. Yeah. Yes, you do maintain. I'll just bring it that he's got up my knee. That's he's all. got arms yeah. involved. So no, 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 just a late tackle. Was it, was it that late? Just a late tackle. Okay, well, late tackle. It's been reversed. Been reversed. Been reversed. Been reversed. There's such a respect to the refs and to the sideline officials as well, and especially to the video refs, you know, with some of the calls that they pull off. Rugby's such a fast action, fast paced game compared to football. Football, if it goes in a goal, it's in a goal. You know, if, if a rugby player is right in the corner of the pitch and only just gets that ball in, the referee's got to make a call there and then as to whether that's that's a try or not. And that's down to the referee. He'll speak to his touches, touch judges, but he won't say he is the final call. The difference between a football ref and a rugby ref is the responsibility that he carries, but he uses his entire team, is that what you're saying, to make his yeah. decisions? Yeah, Whereas with a football ref, he's got it all on his own. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's the, obviously, it's obviously it's a family yeah, show there. Family show that yeah. I can't renounce. It repeats <laughs> you, so. It's definitely gone. Yeah. Cool. All right, yellow. No. All right, okay. All right, yeah. okay. For your choice of words towards me, unfortunately, we cannot accept you. All right. Discipline has been an issue for Greek quiz. So how would you say that makes people treat these referees? And so a football referee, would you say they treat differently to a rugby referee? Yeah, I, I've, having done both for sports, having been to both for sports and been to games, grassroots and big clubs, there's a lot more abuse towards football referees that often gets away. Whereas in rugby league, I don't think, even at the big clubs and the big games, I mean, I went to the World Cup final, I don't think I heard, I heard the odd person say, you know, oh, bad call, ref, or ref, what you're doing, but it's never, it's never a full on chant. And I think chants have a big, hmm. big play in how the refs are treated as well. So what do you think football can learn from rugby with regards to protecting um, and supporting its referees? As a player, if we go over to the referee, we always call him sir. You always address him by, you know, sir, is that? And, you know, your tempers flare because it's, it's a hard-hitting game. It's a contact game. But there's never that disrespect of, you know, sir, what the fuck's going on or anything or hmm. you don't. If you kick off, you do it yourself. And if you kick off, you know you're going to get bolts by a coach anyway, so... That's really interesting. I think, I think in a lot of the clubs do, which is um, a referee campaign. So usually the clubs will have a, I think it's called support the refs. Um, and it's basically a phone number that each club will have. And if there's any abuse, it's, it's a private number, but if there's 
if you hear someone kicking off in the stands and you know you don't you don't like it or you've got kids around and you know the wailing abuse to the ref or even to the players or any of the staff you know you can text this number and so let's say sometime in the far flung future you know, you've got kids mm -hmm. um of the two sports, because of the way the referees are treated, which way would you get your kids to go? That's a good question. I think I'd always want them to go down the rugby route. There's just a lot more respect in the sport. I know from a lot of grassroots, you know, the referee just turns up, gets paid and goes on. Whereas in rugby games, especially in my league, you know, the referee will stay, he'll He'll either have a drink with you in clubhouse, or he'll you know speak to you after a game, or come up to you after a game, announce his uh, man of the match, and yeah. That's really interesting. So the referees are actually not just uh, there for the game; is an in integral part mm. of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant. Would you ever consider being a rugby ref? It's it's something I've considered before, even though I'd love it. It's not where I'd want to be. I wouldn't want to be the ref. I want to be in the action. Sure. Grassroots football is suffering from a reduction in the number of referees out there, so it's getting harder and harder to actually host games. Is this a similar problem with rugby, do you think, or are you, are you good with refs? No, I think, I think it's gaining in our sport. Something I've noticed within grassroots football, if you were to say to somebody, would you be a footy ref? Yeah. Nine out of ten people will be, God, no. You know, get stuffed, I won't have that kind of flack. That immediate question I asked you then, would you be a rugby ref? It's actually something you would consider. Mm -hmm. And there was no response like, I couldn't hack that flack. Mm -hmm. So that's really interesting. It is something that I've considered and it is something that, you know, if I was to, if I was to be a rugby league ref, I feel like I'd be protected very well. Because, you know, Again, going back to the head cam, a lot of them are now wearing head cams. The RFL have issued these head cams out to the coaches, which is brilliant for the game and brilliant for the refs. Hmm. Um, and as well, there's a lot of control by the refs. So, you know, if, if the referee is in charge and the referee says that, again, it goes back to that respect. You know that hmm. nothing's going to flare up. Again, in, and I, I know it happens in every sport, but fights... Rugby's big for fights, everyone knows it. But again, there's that mutual respect for the referees that if you saw the referee and it was in the middle of a pack of fight, everyone would stop. Mm. Or you'd drag it away from the referee. Oh! 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 Hey, c'est bon? Oh! C'est bon, ça va? Hey, hey, c'est bon, ça va aller. Oh, cool. Oh, and Nilesano takes him away. Jared! Jeremy Smith Jared, in the middle of all of this. Jared! Jeremy! Jeremy, Jared, separate. Jeremy, Jared, separate. Be careful, Jared. Nothing silly, boys. Jared, separate. Give him room. Give him room. Uh, just wait. Just wait. We'll sort it out. Because again, there's that mutual respect, so you'd feel protected. Jack, that was fantastic. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Just leaving Jack now, and I'm really impressed, to be honest with you. Um, the rumours are true. So, the level of respect, the protection, um, the way that they're, they're treated, and that's a completely different world, that. Um, I mean, the fact that you call a referee, sir, that kind of says a lot. Um, the way that, I mean, Jack's showing me these videos of all these fights, and most of the players, the first thing they want to do when there's a fight is protect the ref remove him from the situation, make him safe. Uh, these support helplines, I don't know, that was just, that was far better than I expected to be honest with you. I'm, I'm really, really impressed. I want to become a rugby ref. With still no response from any of the governing bodies I have been trying to reach, I've come down to the local grassroots club to get the opinions of some of the kids there on how they see the way referees are treated and viewed within football.
Uh, so hi, my name's Rishi. I'm 12 years old. I play CDM. Hi, my name's Lewis Lava. Um, I'm 12. I just turned 12 yesterday. Hi, I'm Adam. I play. I'm 12. I play the sandal beat, and I play the sandal Hi, I'm Anish. I play right back, and I'm cool. Just sometimes on the football field, when children can get a little bit too passionate, it's mm. sometimes a lot to handle for the referees. Games can get quite heated with not just the children, but the coaches and the parents, and it's quite hard for the referees sometimes. Sometimes the referees sometimes feel under pressure. I think, yeah, like if the referee makes a decision and the players don't agree with it, they might say some stuff and it might put the referee under pressure. Are you blind? Stuff like that. They're getting verbal harassment for their decisions. If there's no refs, uh, some games will have to get cancelled and it like stop some people playing what they like to do. The game wouldn't be fair anymore. Well, I just think that it, this is like the world sport, it's a global sport, and then if there are no referees, then there's nothing we can do because this is th everybody, most people love to play football. And it just makes that like, I think the referee doesn't like it and just makes them feel bad about themselves. But if I was a ref and people were saying stuff like that to me, it made me feel bad and just not want to do it anymore. Uh, but if I was getting all that hate and everything, um, I would be really upset and probably quit, yeah. I'd say at first it sounds like a nice job to have if you could be a referee, but as time goes on, if back in the day it probably wasn't that bad, like words, that there wasn't that much going on, but as time goes on, people, children, feel it's suitable to say that stuff to the referees and then as you get older and older, you no one knows if that might continue and get even worse until where nobody will want to be a referee and then they'd have to completely change the game. It's just disgusting how how much people think that even though it is a football game, it's still another person, another human being is still trying their best in their life where you just feel like everything that you do to them still does affect them in quite a way. No matter what happens on the football pitch, you should also have basic respect for another human being. I think it's a horrible, because just to think that it's another human being on the pitch and everyone makes mistakes, and just because they've done that, there's no reason to threaten them with death threats and stuff, and that might make them like, scared and paranoid and stuff. I mean, just disgusting in general. Like, I think um, the FA, when like they hear about all this really bad stuff that's happening, they could try and like even create a charity or something to try and help everyone, like not just in Bonnie, like around the whole world, to try and respect referees because it's not just happening here; it's happening everywhere, and we really do have to stop it before something's out of hand. Hello, Wayne speaking. Yeah, speaking. Oh, I mind. Oh, yeah, that's right. Thanks for calling me. I really appreciate it. Well, it's um, it's just really questions about your experiences with the abuse that referees get, um, what kind of protections in place for them, what kind of support, what's the FA doing about it, um, you know, really getting to the guts of it. I mean, I know, you know Ref Support UK is a big thing, so we, we, you were the number one contact for me to, to have a talk to about this. Fantastic. Martin, thank you so much. Take care. Bye. Can't believe it. We got Martin Cassidy. Get in! After all my efforts to get some views from respected authorities, I've managed to secure a Zoom meeting with Martin Cassidy. I'm here now with Martin Cassidy, Chief Exec of Ref Support UK. It's an absolute pleasure to meet you, mate. Thank you so much for spending the time to talk to us. Just tell me a little bit about Ref Support UK. Uh, thanks for inviting me on, mate. It's good to be on. Ref Support UK 
uh, was something that was born out of being involved with the referee association. I was chairman of Western Referee Association. I live here in Western, which is Western Super Mayor from Liverpool originally, moved down here 30 odd years ago. Uh, at the time, I was on the Football League as a linesman, started doing a couple of Premier League games to acclimatise me to the lads I got injured. Um, I wrote to the FA, said I'm injured. They still have these jobs are going, coaching referees, the next generation. So I worked at Wembley, coaching the next generation of referees. So to most people, you shout out on, on telly, you know, our coaching team with the ones that are on them. So um, got me redundant from there. It was a bit dodgy how the uh, redundancy was done. So I took the FA to court. I've now got a non disclosure agreement. But while I was there, I knew, I knew there was a big hole and how we support referees. No one was putting out videos where referees were getting their heads kicked in. No one was pushing out that how bad the game was. The referee association won't do it because they get money. They get, they, aesthetically, they've got money off, off the FA. They, to this day, they still get gifts off the FA. They can get tickets to Wembley, to watch England, and cup finals and all this. It's the wrong model. We, as, a, as an organisation, made it clear that we don't want any gifts off the FA. We want nothing off the FA other than them to listen to us. And now we will go public with the problems that are out there. So I started pushing out videos, people were sending to me, people quickly realized that they could talk to us in confidence. And um, one of the things that, that was clear is that referees are scared of having an opinion. And if that opinion is different to the county FA or the FA, then there could be consequences. They don't get a cup final, they might not get promoted, and other things happen. So it quickly, morphed into this sort of politely militant referee organisation that was going, hang on a minute, referees were told, you can't go to press. I've actually got emails from people in the county of A saying, no, no, you can't go to the press, we'll suspend you. So I put that letter out. Other people come forward and said, oh my God, that happened to me. And it's now something where people within the FA and with county of A's and some high ranking referees, as well as grassroots referees, come to us in confidence and say, this has happened. Can you talk about it? Can you get out there? But don't say you got it from me. So we've become this go-to organization now where I'm happy to go on in the press. I'm happy to go on TV. Never had any media training. Just to say, look, this is the problem. What are you going to do about it? So how bad right now do you think it really is out there for referees, especially down, say, the grassroots level? I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit scared that someone's going to be murdered. I fear that day, and, it, and all the signs have been there for a while, that's going to happen. That's definitely going to happen. Now, fortunately, there's a couple of people in the FA that just wouldn't engage with us. We wrote to them about body cameras six years ago, and the email we got back from the individual who was head of the FA then, the police department, said there's no appetite for body cameras from the FA. No appetite. So I said, well, there's no appetite to protect referees. So I thought I'm going to change strategy. So I went to IFAB, who were the like the government body of the rules of football for those people who aren't referees, uh, laws, as, as refs get told to say. And I just, I'm going to challenge them. I'm going to say, why aren't you doing body cams? We believe body cam pilots would be a real progressive move for, for, for the protection of grassroots referees. And he never answered. And he never answered. And he never answered. Kept doing it. So then all of a sudden, the next law changes for World Law 4, uh, world, uh, world Law of Football. Law 5, the referee appeared these words. Referees are not allowed to wear recording devices or cameras. So I said, why do you, why haven't you put this in? He wouldn't answer. So I challenged them and said, legally, from your articles of association, you've got to say why you made the law amendment. So you see something with like handball, they, they, they say, oh, it's because of this, or the offside, triple jeopardy with a penalty and a professional foul. He said, oh, this is why we're doing it. They never did that with this. They just stuck it in. They just stuck it in. But to me, I knew then that I'd had the FA. I'd put press on the FA. They knew I was onto something. And I knew that they knew I was onto something. So I thought, right, I'm going to keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Then last year, the FA contacted me and said, look, we're going to approach IFAB over making a, a world change to football to our body, a body camp pilot, which started a couple of months ago. So there's a little organisation that was born out of frustration and support of referees that is now responsible for the change of world law football, which is what we're absolutely really proud of. Um, and although I've, I've battered the FA publicly for a long time, 
I'm so pleased that they did this. It's the most progressive, positive move they've done in the protection of grassroots referees uh, ever, really. So I'm seeing these green shoots of the FA is actually showing signs that they are going to help grassroots referees. And that should be welcomed, and, and I'll go on the record saying that's great. It isn't just about ref abuse. Body cameras, which are getting trialled now, will prevent homophobic abuse, will, have, will, will prevent racial abuse, anti-Semitism. Every single form of abuse in our game can be prevented by a body camera. And of course, it's, it's an evidence gatherer if something poor does happen. So it can help train aid the referees, or the positions right. What have they said? Because sometimes they say to people the wrong things, and we've all been guilty of that. But they might not know how they come across. So, so there was just there was just no no bad side of having a body camera tile. So, so that's what our journey has been. We've also said that we we want the abuse of a child referee, verbal abuse, threatened abuse, foul abuse language. If you're found guilty of that, we think the club the club should be deducted points. And because as you climb the ladder. You can get refused and being promoted up the ladder if your facilities aren't good enough. Mm. But if your discipline isn't good enough, that's fine, up you go. So there's lots of pieces here that we, we recognise quite early on that needs discussion and needs challenging, and, and, and that's where we are. It's absolutely terrifying to hear you say you think a referee will be murdered. So bravo to you for everything that you're doing for referees. But the fact that you still think there's a possibility that one day a referee will be murdered is absolutely terrifying. Do you think perhaps some of the behaviour of pro footballers is affecting the way that people react younger? I mean, let's take um, Mitrovic, for example. I mean, the horrible, horrible incident that he did. You know, I mean, not violent as such, but pushing the ref. And then you get people like Jamie O'Hara defending him. Um, it's ridiculous. So do you think maybe the pro behaviour is affecting grassroots and that's coming back up? 100%. I can evidence it in many ways. It manifests itself in many ways. Why do grassroots players cut the feet off their socks? They've got red socks. Why? Why do they do that? Why do they wear their socks rolled right down with little tiny shin pads now? Why did they used to wear the collar up like this? <laughs> One reason, they've seen it on TV. They've seen Grealish do it. They've seen Ronaldo do it. They've seen Cantona do it. Right back to a Cruyff term back in the 70s. They mimic what they see on TV. So if they're going to mimic all that, it's absolutely clear that they will mimic the behaviour they've seen by these, these mass officials. And Mitrovic, Mitrovic is a good example of the desensitisation of referee abuse to white lines. We believe Bruno Fernandes, when he pushed Adam Lund on the back a couple of weeks earlier, that should have been acted upon straight away. Instead, we had Dan McGallagher going on Sky saying, oh, well, the Lino grabbed his arm and ooh, tried to mitigate. No, no, no. Wrong move by the FA. Wrong move by Dan McGallagher. Wrong move by the people in football. They should have said Adam Lund was trying to stop him, hit Alexander Arnold in front of the cop. That's a good move. That should have been praised because that could have. So it should have been framed, actually. He was stopping that getting worse with the cars that were going on, blah, 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 and there wasn't. And then what happens? We say that we have this. So loads of people need to see, take responsibility. What's mimicked at the top? The League Managers Association never, ever reach out and say, Jürgen Klopp was wrong. Pep Guardiola was wrong. Warnock was wrong. Jose Mourinho, never say it. They're all their members. It's supposed to be their union. The PFA have never, ever, ever said that's disgraceful behaviour by people like Mitrovic. Like, can't start jumping into the crowd, although they're not similar events as the world's away. They, they could make these statements about the behaviour of their players and they don't. So when everyone takes some owner and stroke responsibility of, of this, the LMA, PFA, the FA, clubs making statements, but they're not made the statements condemning that behaviour by their manager and their player, no, they haven't. So there's lots, of, lots in this that I think stop it spreading from the top down. But also, we need to take responsibility on, on the sidelines to make that behaviour by parents unacceptable. I know we can do that in the game, those who are stakeholders in the youth game. So it's a big piece. There's lots in it. We were speaking to a, a, um, a rugby player uh, about the difference between how referees are treated in rugby league to the FA. 
and he was quite horrified. Uh, a few of my stories you know, about him being intimidated and shouted out and yelled at. And he was saying from grassroots, referees in rugby, they're called Sir, for starters. Um, they've, the whole area has got helplines to call. If you hear any kind of abuse, phone these, and it gets investigated straight away. Do you feel that the FA are doing enough to support and protect referees? No, I don't. I don't think they have for a while. But however, like I said earlier, it looks like they're doing it. It's interesting that you, you, you mentioned a hotline. Four, maybe five years ago, we started the first ever 24-7, 365-day helpline. Not one county FA or the FA promote this helpline. Not one. But we get calls every week. We get calls every other day. So that proves the helpline. And what's, what's important about the helpline is, is that people phone us and they'll say, this happened to me, or I must be a shit ref or whatever, pardon my friends. I must be a rubbish ref. But it's not, the first thing we say to them is, it's not your fault, mate. And you're not on your own. We're getting these calls every day, and this is a snippet of, of what's happening. So please don't think it's your fault, and please don't think you're, you're on your own. You know, how can we help and we talk them through it? If they leave the number, we don't even ask, ask to, you know, to save the number, or we don't even ask the name sometimes, they just want to talk to people. If they do allow us to take the name and take the number, we... We, we call them back a week later, how, how are you doing? One of the questions we asked them, have you, have you talked to the FA? A lot of them say, no, because it happened to me four years ago when the lad got off, or he just didn't take care of it and he never got back to me. Or So the, so the problem around the FA say, oh, it's only 0.1%, so you say, of games of a proven case of assault. That's because people aren't reporting them. People aren't reporting them. And also, our football is not like Tottenham Chelsea, where Mark Clattenberg live in Newcastle and referees them all live in London. You'll see people, many people, in the area of where you live, who you've refereed or you've sent off. You're going to bump into them. So, so that, another reason to say, because I know he drinks in my pub, I know I'll see him in a supermarket, if I send him off. Or, so there's all these little nuances within our level of football, compared to top five football. And again, I don't think it's being recognised. Do you know of any other organisation that makes money from violence or threats to an individual apart from the FA? Yeah, MMA. <laughs> That's it, really. I mean, and the mafia. The mafia make money out of violence. Yeah. So it's interesting that if you if you've got a, a, an organisation that makes money purely from people threatening referees or threatening players or kicking players or having the word sort of referees. Why would you want to address it properly when it's worth nine million to the organization? It's about nine million a year. And some of the money they say are for verbal abuse and threats to children. That's not a good look. Making money out of the abuse no. and threats towards a child. So we've asked them to stop doing that. Stop making money, but take at youth level, deduct points. Clearly, money, the money punishment doesn't work because they've been doing it for decades. When I used to play, I used to get me £10 fine, whatever. So it doesn't work. It clearly is not work. So they do points and watch these clubs take control of you. They sign and who they have on the touchlines. Watch them take control of it themselves. What more can be done? What more can we do to support and protect our referees to stop this decline and to make them want to be refs and come and join? Um, I know we're starting to get a little bit pressed for time, but... You know, in an ideal world, what can we do? What, what's, what, what's left for us now, Martin? I, I think all what we mentioned. Get, let's get this body cam trial through as quick as you can. Let, let's, get, let's, get, um, let's get points deduction for, for people who, who threaten and abuse refs. Let's not give Mitovic a short ban. Let's give him a massive ban. Absolute massive ban. And incidentally, that, Darren Drysdale, I don't remember him, re referee, he got, he got banned for quite a long time because he stuck his head into Ipswich player, judge. It was a massive news, massive news. Well, you know, Jeremy O'Reilly actually said then, fair play to the referee. I, I didn't blame him for what was getting said. So he's going to get, he got, he got a big punishment. Let's see if Mitrovic gets the punishment that Darren Drysdale got. Probably not. Have you got a message for those of us out here, I don't know, all the referees out there to, to sort of like tell them to keep going? Refereeing improves your life a lot of the times. 
I've got lifelong friendships, close, close friendships with people who I only met through refereeing. So I always say go for it. I'll never say don't get into refereeing, even though I talk about this stuff that's happened. But we're there. You don't have to be around. We don't have to pay for that help. We're a charity. We'll help you anytime, 24-7, whenever you want parents of Charles. We've got mentor schemes. doesn't cost a bean. But no one pushes us. No county FA pushes us, to our knowledge, because we talk about the stuff they don't want us to talk about. And that's not a fair arrangement. So I think allowing more people to know we're out there to help and support them, a lot of it's just a you know a phone call. Feel feels like they got someone on the, on the shoulder. The next time we go out, that isn't a body cam there. So there's there's yeah there's a lot, loads loads we can do more. But I'd always say take up the whistle, take it with give it a go. If something happens to you, go find help. And that help isn't always the county FA. There's other places like Let's Support UK who will help support you free of charge. We've travelled all over this country, all over this country, helping referees at hearings where someone reported them or, or that they've been assaulted and, you know, the, the lads appealed. We go there, we support you. We don't charge. No one in Ref Support UK gets a fee. I've never made a fee. I've been on Sky Sports or in any article. It's all donations. No other trustees or coaches take any form of expenses. And our currency that we operate on is the currency of passion and the desire to give back and, and support people. Well, as a referee myself, that's absolutely filled me with joy. What a brilliant thing to say. Ref Support UK, everybody needs to know about it for a fact. Um, Martin Cassidy, Chief Exec of Ref Support UK, I can't thank you enough for your time today. Appreciate it hugely. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting us on. What can I say about that? That Martin Cassidy interview was something else. That guy's seen it all and more. I mean, I can't believe some of the things he was actually talking about. He still really, really believes that a ref's gonna get murdered. It's, it's terrifying. The, the amount he's pushing, the, the energy he's putting behind, getting body cams out there. The, I don't know, his passion for it all. It was absolutely mind blowing. I'm stunned. I'm absolutely stunned. I can't believe the work that this guy's doing for refs and for football. I mean, let's be fair, you know, the no ref, no game thing. It's really, really real. And he's doing everything he can to protect refs. But at the end of it all, he's going to protect football. You'd think people would be singing and dancing for him. They'd be shouting his name up to the skies, but they're not. I don't get that. I mean, Ref Support UK is really, really something that needs to be taken notice of, I think. After listening to him and, and that, I'm, I'm shocked. It can be quite depressing when you consider that the game created at grassroots level that affects everything on the world stage is now being influenced by those at the top because of the way that they are behaving. Footballers, the idols of our younger players are being copied in the way that they so awfully show their attitudes to these referees. But worse still, they're doing it with little, if any consequence, further convincing our youngsters that it's perfectly okay to do it. Referees are seen as villains, when in fact, they're probably the guys that are in love with the game more than anybody else. Why else would they turn up to receive such flack in their need to make, let the game go ahead? There's a woefully high amount of inaction or resistance to change. 
it's causing frustration and forcing the very people this sport needs to survive to leave in their droves. It's looking more and more like that the one thing that will save football is that a referee will die because of it. But there's hope. Because of people like Martin Cassidy at Ref Support UK, because of these welfare officers and clubs now talking to parents and these youngsters, because of referees like me taking a stand and saying enough is enough, the FA will finally and have to make a movement. We need now more than ever to understand that the term no ref, no game isn't just a catchphrase. It's a fact because as our numbers dwindle, the very future of football is at risk.